It's a great delight to have Stan Crowley with us. When I was in college, I had garnered the nickname The Thinker. But when I think about one who could truly wear that title, I think about Stan Crowley. For 18 years, he worked in a think tank, gained his PhD in physics, University of Virginia. But we're very thankful. He is a graduate of the Southwest School of Bible Studies right here back in 2002. He served as an elder. He currently preaches for the Schertz Congregation, which is home of the annual Schertz Lectures. What makes him valuable for the current lesson he will be presenting, struggling with addictions, is that he has served as a counselor for those who have been struggling with addictions. When we think about needing God's help with life struggles, among the many struggles many people face are addictions of all kinds of stripes and colors. Please give your undivided attention to Brother Stan Crowley. Well, first, my thanks to all of those who were involved in inviting me to be a part of this lectureship. I certainly do appreciate that. Not my first occasion to be grateful to this congregation. Very grateful for the opportunity that I had to attend the Southwest School of Bible Studies between 2000 and 2002. And it's good to be back again. And I consider it a special privilege to have an opportunity to talk about this vital topic, struggling with addictions. And in the beginning, let me say, do not think that this lesson is only for those who have been involved or are involved with alcohol or some other addictive drug. The scope of destructive habits is much, much broader than that. I'll start out by talking about substance abuse, but along the way, I think I'll talk about some things that hit much closer to home for every one of us. And let me be clear with the disclaimer in the beginning, I am not a psychiatrist, I am not a psychologist, I am not a licensed professional counselor. The things that I know, I indeed learned sitting around the table with those who had been struggling with addictions. When I graduated from Southwest in 2002, I started preaching for the Church Church of Christ. I soon learned that some members there had established and were operating a drug and alcohol rehabilitation center. It is called the How Foundation, H period, O period, W period, How Foundation. The 50 men of that residential drug and alcohol uh, abuse program, uh, they earn their own living by providing care to trees, a tree care service. Some of you may have had your trees trimmed by the men of the How Foundation. They operate in the Austin also, as well as the San Antonio area. How Foundation established by the Teague family, currently directed by Walter Teague IV. And it was not long after I appeared there in church that Walter asked me to come out to the foundation and present devotionals for the men. I was out there once or twice a month. That opportunity soon turned into the opportunity to have Bible studies, weekly Bible studies. I have indeed sat around the table with the men of the How Foundation for many, many hours. Dozens of them have been baptized over the past decade. I was there to teach them the fundamentals of salvation. I was there to teach them the fundamentals of Christian living. But those men were teaching me a lot more than I realized at the time. Woven into our discussion about the scriptures were discussions about their past struggles, about their present progress. And during one of these discussions, one of the men said... He referred to the urge to indulge as when the insanity strikes. And I will tell you his use of that phrase about insanity. That was a turning point in my understanding about addictions. Because I resisted that phrase. That anything was an insanity. Uh, to my mind, all decisions were sane decisions. They were made with rational thinking, logical deductions. So I thought, well, I will just explain to these men if they keep drinking or doing drugs, that they're going to lose their jobs, they're going to destroy their relationship with their families, they're going to injure their health. I will explain that to them and they will say, oh, well, thank you, Stan, very much for explaining that to me so logically. Well, of course, I will quit. I will quit right now. It just did not work that way. <laughs> Why? Because addiction is not logical. 
In fact, maybe it is just exactly that illogical part of addiction that makes it fit the definition of an addiction. An addiction is something that a person does even though they know it's harmful. Dictionary says about addiction, a continued involvement with a substance despite the negative consequences associated with it. People know, people in their saner moments, they know the harm. But when that urge to have a drink or to have a drug, when that insanity strikes, that compulsion is stronger than logic. And as I learned more, some additional lights began to come on very slowly within my head. <laughs> I thought, wait, pornography is like this. And about that time, some came to talk to me about their problems with pornography. Well, I thought again, I will just logically explain to this young man, if he continues to view pornography at his workplace, which is what he was doing, and we may agree, there's, that's not a completely sane thing to do. But I will just explain to him, if you continue to persist in this behavior, you're going to lose your job. You're going to ruin your relationship with your family. You're going to greatly compromise your example as a Christian. But again, my very logical admonition had little lasting effect. Pornography was another one of those forms of insanity, an addiction, a compulsion that was stronger than logic. And the dictionary also includes that. The dictionary says an addiction, a recurring compulsion to engage in some specific activity despite the harmful consequences. Well, then ever so slowly, additional lights began to go off in my head. I thought, wait, gambling is like that. You know, they have a gambling anonymous just like they have an Alcoholics Anonymous. There's compulsive lying. There's compulsive stealing. To some people, outbursts of anger have become a habit, a destructive habit within their lives. Think about it. There are many others. And I'm convinced that if we are really, really honest with ourselves, don't we all have those patterns of behavior that at times we realize are destructive? Those patterns of behavior are not good for us. But despite our recognition of that, there are times that we slip back into that pattern of behavior. And aren't these things, aren't they really fundamentally all the same? They're patterns of behavior. Destructive behaviors that have taken hold of a person and they engage in them despite the, lot, despite the destructive consequences. The compulsion is stronger than logic. And then, and this took years. <laughs> I'm giving you in a few minutes tonight what took me years to put together. But then one of the really big lights came on. All of these things that we've been talking about, they're an example of a big, much broader category. The Bible has a word for these things. The Bible has a word for these things that are destructive, they're harmful to us, but we do them anyhow. And that word is sin. What did Jesus say, John 8, 24? Most assuredly, I say to you, whoever commits sin is a slave of sin. I think it's possible that we have not taken seriously enough that word slave. Is it possible? Is it just possible that that word slave refers to that habit forming, addicting power of sinful habits? Sin wants to keep me as its slave. Proverbs 5.22, Solomon talks about sin as a trap. He said his own iniquities entrap the wicked man. He is caught in the cords of his sin. And David, Psalm 40, David paints an even more dramatic picture of the awful kind of captivity that sin can bring. Psalm 40, verse 2 says, He brought me up out of a horrible pit, out of the miry clay. David says he's been in a pit, horrible pit. Pits were drug to, dug to trap animals. Sometimes they, were, they, caught, they caught crooks, they caught thieves. They were the steep sides of the pit that held in the person, but that's not all. It was not just the walls that held the captive. At the bottom of those pits, just as David alludes to, they put a miry, sticky clay. So once a person was in that trap, the bottom of the pit actually held on to the feet of the person. So that the person was indeed in the grasp 
of that pit. And those who have let themselves fall under the influence of any of those addictions, those who have felt the pull of those destructive habits, they're going to recognize this picture that David paints here, that God through David paints. It's a deep pit and it's got a sticky bottom. What did Jesus say? Whoever commits sin is a slave of sin. We dare not underestimate the power in that word slave. Amen. But if we have not fully appreciated that word slave, maybe we also have not fully appreciated. Maybe we have not fully trusted in the promises that God has given us that we can have freedom again. Have we undervalued? Have we failed to trust God's promises of escape? Even from the most strongest addiction. The Apostle Peter in his second letter talks about one of those great promises from God. Starting in verse 2 of chapter 1 of 2 Peter. He says, grace and peace be multiplied to you in the knowledge of, our, of God and our Lord Jesus Christ. Peace. Isn't that what we want in our life? One night when we sat around the tables, we were talking about prayer. And one of the men from that Howe Foundation said the thing that he prayed most for was peace in his life. What we want is peace. What destroys our peace? Things that pull on us destroy our peace. Things that pull us, pull us in a direction that we know is a wrong direction. When we are entrapped in sin, we have lost the peace. The next verse is Peter begins to explain to us how we can get that peace back again. Verse 3, he talks about God's divine power has given us all things that pertain to life and godliness. Verse 4 talks about the exceeding great and precious promises that we have from God. Promises? What promises? He talks about one of these. He says that through these you may be partakers of the divine nature. Amen. We can have the divine nature. Remember, man was created in the image of God. We were intended to have that good, that wholesome nature. I become frustrated. I become so frustrated. <laughs> With those who, when somebody does something bad, they'll say, well, that's just human nature to do those bad things. No, 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 it is not. <laughs> what an insult. What an insult to the good God who created us to suggest that it is our nature to sin. We are not born with a sinful nature. Amen. Despite some of those translations or versions that indicate that. What an insult to God to suggest that we have a sinful nature. That's not the nature God wants us to have. That's not the nature with which he created us. Solomon says, Ecclesiastes 7, 29, God made man upright. That's the way we were created. God made man upright, but they have sought out many schemes. We absolutely can have the godly nature that God intended for us to have. That God created us to have. God promises us that we can get out of the grip of that pit of destructive habits. Peter closes the thought, having escaped, there's our word, escape. Having escaped the corruption, there's that pit. <laughs> having escaped the corruption that is in the world through lust, there it is. God's promise of escape. We can always be, we can always become again. What we were intended to be. Amen. What we were created to be. We can escape. We have God's word on it. So how grateful we are. How grateful we ought to be for that path of escape. That God has provided. But for those who are addicted. Whatever destructive habit they're addicted to. Many times logical explanations alone. Just do not work. Logical explanations alone are not the path out of their destructive habit. So what is the path? <laughs> well, that man who started his sentence that said, when the insanity strikes, he completed that sentence with the thought that the addict must turn to some source outside himself. In the moment of the compulsion, our thinking is not sound. To pull yourself out of the grasp of that distorted pattern of thinking, you must trust something outside yourself. 
I am convinced that for many people at least, the successful treatment of addiction is trust. Now that outside anchor of trust, it may be a family member, it may be a friend, it may be a counselor, it may be a program. A program like Alcoholics Anonymous, one of the other addiction programs. Ultimately, of course, of course, the best set of principles to trust is the Bible. We trust God. Now in this path of trust, let me say sometimes... Sometimes it's hard for a person to transition immediately to that trust in God. They need somebody they can see, somebody they can talk to, somebody they can learn to trust. So sometimes the path of trust starts with an individual. Hopefully, ultimately, it transitions to that trust in God, that trust in God's word, that trust in the things that God has told us are good for us. The things he's told us are bad for us. Well, then finally... (laughs) The really, really big light came on and it was there. It was there all the time. I just hadn't seen it. The really bright light is simply stated in 2 Corinthians 5 verse 7. We walk by faith, not by sight. Isn't that why those people are listed in Hebrews chapter 11? (laughs) They trusted what God said more than they trusted what they had personally observed. Noah built that ark, though he had likely never seen rain. Abraham trusted that God could and would raise his son Isaac from the dead, though there is no prior record of such. They trusted what God said more than they trusted their own thinking. They trusted what God said more than their own reasoning, more than their own logic. They walked by faith, not by sight. And once... Once you see that enlightening principle, you find it everywhere in God's word. Jeremiah 10, 23. Oh, Lord, I know the way of a man is not in himself. It is not in himself who walks to direct his own self, his own path. He needs something outside himself. Solomon, Proverbs 3, 5. Trust in the Lord with all your heart. And we need to stop and talk about the word all. All your heart. The path of escape from an addiction is not a half-hearted trust in anything. Trust the Lord with all your heart. Lean not to your own understanding. It's not in here. It's out there. It's up there. (laughs) The psalm is Psalm 17 verse 5. Uphold my steps in your path that my footsteps may not slip. That I may not slip down into one of those sticky pits. And finally, if you want the explicit statement that total faith in God's instructions is the escape from the snare and the slavery of sin, how about Psalm 119, 133? Psalm 119, 133. Direct my steps by your word and let no iniquity have dominion over me. There's the way to escape the grasp of those sinful habits, the pit, the snare, the illogical compulsion, have to trust in God above all else. We do what God says just because God says so. We don't have to think about it. We don't have to reason about it. We don't have to decide whether we think it's logical or not. When we get our thinking involved or those who are involved in destructive habits, when their thinking gets involved, things go wrong. They need to have that absolute and total trust in God. If God says it's good, we do it. If he says it's bad, we stay as far away from it as we can. We do what God says just because he says it. I think we need to fully grasp the import of walk by faith, not by sight. That is the path of escape. That is the way out of the snare the pit, the slavery. Now let's look at some applied lessons. Lesson number one, a person must never, never, never sample sin. Let me share with you what I think is one of the most frightening passages in the Bible. (laughs) Proverbs chapter two, it's a warning from Solomon to his son. 
He warns that from the first sample of sin, a person is forever changed. Now, the example he gives is of an immoral woman. The principle is much broader than that. Proverbs 2.19 of the immoral woman, he warns, none who go to her return. None who go to her return. Well, of course, they can physically return. Of course, they can be forgiven of their sin if they repent and follow God's plan for forgiveness. But the warning here for our young people, not just for young people, there is a great danger from even sampling sin once. When you sample it once, you are forever changed. I have never sampled a cigarette. A cigarette lit or unlit has never touched these lips. Smoking is just not an option for me. There's no temptation for me to smoke. I, the, the, the decision never comes to my mind. Well, should I have a cigarette this afternoon? It's just not a decision. It's just not a choice. It's not a thought. But for those who have smoked, it's a decision that they have to make and remake and remake sometimes many times a day. Even after they try to quit, it's a decision they're making for days, for weeks, for months, maybe for years. For those who have oversampled alcohol or drugs, <laughs> they know. Those men in the AA program, they get it. They know that because of their past behavior, their life is forever changed. In an AA meeting, when a person stands up, every one of them, to make some statement at a meeting, they say, my name is, and I'm an alcoholic. My name is, and I'm a drug addict. And I believe with that statement, what they're doing, they are acknowledging that every day of their life, they live with that additional vulnerability because in the past they'd given in. Solomon warns, once you sample sin, things have changed. Just don't do it. Don't do it the first time. Don't do it for any sin. <clears throat> don't take one sip. Don't take one puff. Don't take one peek at the wrong kind of printed material. So many people today tell our young people, well, you should try everything at least once. <laughs> Just once won't hurt you. Solomon says that's a lie. Once you have sampled sin, you are that much more vulnerable for the next sample. Applied lesson number two. We must constantly examine ourselves. Yes, us. We must constantly examine ourselves for patterns, patterns of behavior, patterns of thought that are starting to go in a wrong direction. 1 Corinthians 10, 1 Corinthians 6. Paul talks about things that are lawful. But they may not be expedient. They may not edify. They may not build up. They're not sin yet. But he says we should not allow ourselves to be brought under their power. A habit does not have to be immediately sinful to be ultimately destructive. If you don't want to wind up in San Antonio, don't get on I-35 and turn south. If there's some place you do not want to be, don't even get close to the road that goes there. Stay far, far away. Lesson number three. We must develop a relationship with God that cultivates our total trust in him. God's knowledge, God's wisdom are amazing. Romans eleven thirty three. 33, Paul extols, oh, the depth of the riches, both of the wisdom and the knowledge of God. How unsearchable are his judgments. His ways are past finding out. God's knowledge and wisdom are perfect. He is the one who always knows what is best for us. And he's the one who always wants what's best for us. You know, there's sometimes we know what's best, but we're just not in a mindset where we want it. God always knows what's best for us. He always wants what's best for us. He has told us what is best for us. So when we read his instructions for something, why? Why would we do anything different than that? Why would we ever doubt that what he says is the absolute best for us? 
Is that not how the first sin was introduced into the world? Satan convinced Eve to doubt God. To think that God was trying to hold back something good from her. Doubting God was the basis of that first sin. And I would ask you to think about it. <laughs> isn't doubting God, isn't that somehow the basis of every sin? If we ever doubt, if we ever doubt the total goodness of God's instructions to us, then we do not have the path of escape. Because the path of escape is total trust in God. Lesson number four. We must develop a relationship with our fellow Christian that allows our fellow Christians to be our support group as we struggle against sin. AA program has two fundamental components, a set of principles contained in that big book. And that big book is pretty good. It's a lot of biblical principles interwoven into that alcoholic's big book that they have. They have two things. They have a set of principles in that book, big book, and they have a support group. But that combination wasn't original with AA. God had already established that combination. He has given us his principles in his divine book. And in this era, he has put all of his followers into the support group that we know as the Lord's church. When we start to struggle with habits, compulsive habits, sinful habits, we need to have that relationship of trust with one another. But let me tell you, you cannot wait until you need that relationship to develop that relationship. To be helped with one of these compulsions, you need to have a lot of trust in somebody else. And that trust is not developed overnight. We need to be working on developing that trusting relationship with one another. Remember Hebrews chapter 10, 24 and 25? And let us constantly, and let us consider one another in order to stir up love and good works, not forsaking the assembling of ourselves together. Brethren, those are support group meetings. Don't miss a one of them. We need to learn to trust one another. That's a part of God's plan. Helping us deal with these destructive, sinful habits. Lesson number five. How can we help a family member or a friend who is struggling with an addiction? It is not easy. Sometimes family members, even friends, sometimes their suggestions of help and support are not well received. Within the Alcoholics Anonymous program, there are, there are special meetings for those who have somebody who is involved in drugs. Let me just offer you a couple of suggestions. For the person who's involved in that destructive habit, you need to try to understand their struggle from their point of view. Sometimes we continue to assault them with logic because that's all we know. We continue to assault them with logic when they are under the sway of that compulsion that is stronger than logic. What they need is somebody to develop that relationship of trust with them. Now, I know that I said the ultimate thing that we need to trust is God. But again, sometimes that trust needs to start with a person. Somebody that's closer by. It needs to be developed. It needs to be strengthened. And then ultimately transitioned. To God's word and his principles. But they need, they need to have that relationship of trust. I would suggest to you that if you have somebody that's involved with drugs or alcohol, either you have to be willing to take the time to be that person of trust. And it's not easy. It's going to take some time. It's not a half an hour a week proposition to have to build that kind of trust. You either need to help, you either need to take the time to be that person they learn to trust, or you need to help them find somebody. Find some outside person, some counselor, some program that can be that outside source of trust. In conclusion, my conclusion is the 
The key to overcoming an addiction, the key to overcoming a sinful habit, the key to overcoming a destructive habit is trust. And the only always reliable source to trust is God and his revelation to us. Psalm 119, 133, direct my steps by your word and let no iniquity have dominion over me. Total faith in God's instructions. And, by the way, total faith in God's instruction can keep us out of that pit. I used to say that God's instructions are like fences that kind of keep us in. I don't say that anymore. I now describe God's instructions as guardrails. They are guardrails to keep us away from those things that are harmful to us. Those sticky pits, those deep pits with the sticky bottoms, they're on the other side of those guardrails. You stay inside the guardrails, you won't have to worry about those pits. Complete trust in God's instructions can keep us out of the pits. But when we have slipped and we have fallen into one of those pits... We need that absolute trust in an outside source. God's word is the only reliable source for that. We learn to do what God says just because he says it. We walk by faith, not by sight. Thank you very much.